On today's Strength for Life podcast, my wife, Britton, and I, we sit down with Dr. Kurt Skelly. Dr. Skelly is known for his energetic and balanced and Bible-centered preaching. He is the pastor of Faith Baptist Church in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Also, he serves as the chairman of the board for Veritas Baptist College, and he's the owner of Land of the Bible Tours, plus he's the host of the Everyday Truth podcast. Britt and I really enjoyed sitting down with Pastor Skelly for this pod, and I think you'll enjoy this conversation as well, and primarily you'll enjoy it because it's Christ-centered and it was lots of fun, and that is a, rep a recipe for providing lots of strength for your life. Welcome to the Strength for Life podcast with Pastor James C. Johnson, a ministry of North Stone Baptist Church in Pensacola, Florida. Pastor Skelly, thank you so much for joining us on the Strength for Life podcast. Now, you are an energetic preacher. People know you for your energy. And I do see some coffee here. Yep. Is there any correlation? Is that how you fuel your energy? Is your coffee interests? You know, I uh, I haven't given that a lot of thought. Maybe, uh, although this is not the probably the best uh, advertisement for your podcast. This is Raceway Coffee. Okay. <laughs> uh, which I was saying before the podcast, th this is coffee that I buy based upon a state of philosophy, which is. A bad cup of coffee is better than no cup of coffee. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. There was just no other coffee shop on the way. I, I mean, got Palafox you. Okay. has no coffee shops. Right. And I can yeah. turn on nine mile and I'm like, this is, I'm, I'm going for Raceway. Yeah. Here right. Yeah. Right. Now, if you could have any coffee, what's your favorite? You know, that's changed. Okay. That's changed over the years. My, my favorite coffee is the coffee I make every morning on my Breville. Oh, I, okay. I you know, grind Ooh, my own beans. Breville. I do. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh yeah, you're a serious guy. About oh, I'm coffee I'm beans. serious. Yeah. I'm serious. Okay. And people send me beans, and then you might be listening right now, and you might have a favorite bean. Send it to me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right, and right, uh, right. I I uh, grind the beans and and use some heavy cream. We laughed about this this week at Pensacola, and I just love it. Smooth cup of coffee. Mm. Okay, cool. What are some Kurt Skelly hobbies? I mean, coffee sounds like a bit of a hobby for you. What else? Are you a golfer, a hunter, a runner? <laughs> You know, I like to golf. When when COVID hit, I golfed every day for eighty straight days. Okay, and wow. I've golfed once since. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. Because all my outside meetings canceled. Sure. I have nothing to do, and I I kind of have the fidget factor. I've got to be doing something. Yeah. So I went every day. I three o'clock every day after work. I just go in, but uh, life got busy again. Yeah. And I I'm back to my stretch of no golf. When I golf, I get so frustrated. I'm not a golfer. Uh, two of our three sons have gotten into golf, so they try to get their father out there, you know. But uh, I'm not an Arminian, but if you could lose your salvation, I would on a golf course, okay? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I get so frustrated. Yeah. We have a North Stone Open that does golfing together pretty good. And then we have some disc golfers and Strength mm. for Life sponsors Dustin Odom, one of the disc Yeah, golfers. shout out to Dustin so, Odom. He's a terrific disc golfer. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. See, I'm 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 not familiar with disc golf. I still just call it frisbee. Oh, right. sure, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, and the disc golfers look at me with disdain. Yes, no, that's how you know. Frisbee. It's not frisbee. Right. Yeah, yes. they get all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you have the fidget factor, is what you just referred to it, and I I talked I about your energy and preaching. Do you think it's just like genetics? The energy. Yeah, I think is it's a God's ADHD. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Yeah. I probably would have been diagnosed with all these with all these <laughs> letters if if I had lived. Today, if I'd been you know, a kid today, but no, I've always yeah. had a high level of energy. I don't know if it's been metabolism. Yeah. Now, Pastor Monty went to Greece with you. Mark, Mark Monty did. He said he loved the trip and he loved your energy to the point that I think you might be a touch older than him. I'm not sure. He, he, may, he may have said that to me, but he was jealous of your energy. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. You're yeah. known for that. Now, Brother Skelly, did you have all that energy when you were a student in school? I did. And the reason I ask is because one of the – this is a be known fact. This is um, unanimously known. Shirley Jones is one of the dearest saints in our church. Mm -hmm. And you know Shirley Jones. Can I you do. explain to the listeners how you know Shirley Jones? Shirley Jones, her daughter, a little bit younger than I, we went to school together. Okay. And Shirley Jones, could, of all people, could tell you – that Kurt Skelly would probably have been the last person that she would have ever anticipated would have been in ministry. Okay. And I was constantly getting into trouble. 
So, and I'm sure she's probably told you a story or two. Oh yeah. Well, now, how did you know it was God's will for you to be pastoring? You pastor two churches, is that correct? Yeah. So when I, I, I trusted Christ as my savior going into my senior year of high school. So I was kind of a game player. You know, that happens a lot in Christian schools Mm -hmm. where they're just kind of inoculated to Christianity. That was me. And I had gone to a summer camp. The only time in my high school experience I went to a camp, hated it, Mm -hmm. but God used it. And I heard some some really convicting preaching, made no decisions. Mm -hmm. But when I came home from camp, uh, then I just, I was wrestling with it. And just by myself at my house, I got saved. Amen. And right after that, you know, my, my life didn't bear fruit tremendously at first, but I, I had this sense almost immediately after I was saved that I was going to be communicating God's word in some way, shape, or form. Mm-hmm. And I really can't explain it except to say it was just an impression, a strong impression that God gave me. So when I graduated from high school, you know, I went to Bible college just with that notion now, I didn't know what I was going to do, what what vocation it was, but I just knew it would involve communicating God's word. Mm-hmm. Yeah, amen. Yeah. That's great. One of the preacher boys at PCC submitted a question and said, what would right now Kurt Skelly tell a young Kurt Skelly about ministry? I, I would probably say, uh, well, that's a great question. I, I would say that the habits that you develop now will follow you for a lifetime. And and that to me, you know, for instance, I was just thinking about David the other day, that very famous passage in 1 Samuel 16. You think about what were his private habits in 1 Samuel 16. So, so private that even his dad didn't expect him to be anything. He, he wrote songs, right? He practiced his harp, wrote songs. He defended sheep with a slingshot probably, Mm. and he cared for sheep. And when his ministry matured years later, those were the three skills that marked David's life. Mm -hmm. He's the great psalmist. Mm -hmm. Well, there's the harp and the songwriting. He was the victor on the battlefield against Goliath. Well, there's the sling, Mm -hmm. you know, then even the Davidic covenant, you know, when God clarified that through Nathan, he said, David, I don't want you to build me a house. I want you to care for my people like a shepherd cares for sheep. Mm-hmm. So so those skills that he learned as a teenager really were the skills, mm-hmm. the lifetime skills. So I would say to a, a college student, a high school student, I would say, really don't worry about being something. Don't worry about fame or don't worry about necessarily the, the, the typical preacher skill sets. Just work on those areas of private character yeah. and God will use those in a big way later. Amen, yeah. So uh, my wife and I are together interviewing you. Uh, would you talk to us about your wife and what she has meant to you over the years of ministry? Oh yeah, so Wanda is the reason I can do what I do. I, I say teasingly that nobody else would put up with me. Like nobody else, <laughs> I'm schizophrenic, I'm a mile a minute and Wanda is just, She's stable, she's steady, she is uh, she is the glue of our family and always has been. Interestingly, when I left Harvest Baptist, so you asked that question about pastoring. I started a church uh, back in the early 90s, mm-hmm. pastored for five years in Connecticut, okay. 20 years in the Pittsburgh area of Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. and then the last, I'm um, in my eighth year in at Faith Baptist in Fredericksburg, Virginia. So three, you pastor three churches. Right, okay, mm-hmm. yeah. So so Wanda, when, when we left Harvest, I was about to turn 50, and the deacons said that they had organized a send, send-off service for me, mm-hmm. and they had brought, they were gonna bring in four preachers. Mm-hmm. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. And I tried to guess, who, who are they? I was thinking through ministry friends. Well, what it ended up being was my four, my four kids. Oh, oh, really special, oh, yeah. Sure. So they each spoke from oldest to youngest. And what was interesting is, and this this is a really good takeaway if, if you're a, a fellow pastor, really good takeaway, none of them spoke of any message I preached. Hmm. So think about that. That not one of them said, dad, you preached this message or this Bible study or none of them. And then 
they spoke for about five minutes about their dad and they spoke for about 25 minutes about their mom. Hmm. Okay. So that will tell you our family. Mm -hmm. You know, Wanda was always committed to our home, to our family, our safe haven. Mm -hmm. uh, even today, I mean, she's abuela, which is Spanish mm -hmm. for, for grandma. Yeah. yeah okay. and, and she's the glue yeah. of our family. That's yeah. wonderful. Um, I noticed your ring. Your ring is really neat. I wish that everyone could see that. Yeah. So what is the significance with that ring? Yeah. So this is, I am my beloved and he is mine. It's written in Hebrew. So I, as you know, I own an Israel company mm -hmm. called Land of the Bible Tours. And I bought this ring on one of my first Israel trips. It's got our initials on the inside and the date of our wedding, which was 625-88. And it's just, it's a good reminder to just for our marriage, but it's a good reminder just of Israel and, and the love covenant, the marriage covenant that sure. God you know, ordained. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. So how did you and your wife meet? And to say it in like more of a common vernacular representing today, like, did you riz her up? How did you riz <laughs> her up back riz her, in did I riz, Did I riz her up? Riz. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I've got all kinds of riz. I've got all kinds of aura points. Yeah, all that. Um, yeah, so now, now do you want my version? Or do you want Wanda's version, which she also calls, AKA the true, the true version. <laughs> yeah. So my well, you're, version- you're your brother, so. Yeah, yeah so my version, as I was walking down the hallway, minding my own business, and she jumped at my feet and you know hung on and asked me to marry her. <laughs> it's like a but, real uh, Boaz moment, yeah, sounds like. It was like. a Boaz moment. <laughs> right, right. That, that's not what happened. I, I pursued her. Uh, she worked at the lunch line at, at our college, and she, she, you know, I just thought she was cute, thought she was, uh, um, just lo loved her personality. You know, I'd go through every day. So I actually said to one of her friends, one of her Spanish friends, I said, hey, I would like to say something to her. Because she spoke very broken English. Okay. So I said, I'd like to say something to her in Spanish. You know, I'm trying to make this impression. So this friend gave me this statement. I, I knew no Spanish and had me rehearse it and rehearse it. Yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> so I trusted her friend. So I would just say, as a word of caution, don't trust Spanish women. <laughs> but anyway, so I, I, I said this to my wife, and the translation is, I said, you need to go take a bath. No. Oh, boy. So the no. very first thing I said to my wife to be was, you need to go take a bath. <laughs> Her eyes got big and she just started going off in Spanish. Oh, and, that's yeah, funny. it yeah. was funny. That's You'd hilarious. probably just stood there cheesing oh, like, Oh yeah. yeah, I did, yeah. I did, yeah. So that's the I, opposite I, of Riz. I don't yeah. know what the opposite I of Riz would be. I but... played, but actually that worked to my favor. Yeah, right, ultimately. Because <laughs> it was memorable, right? That's a great yeah. story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. you mentioned a few words in Spanish. Like, have you picked up the Spanish language now? I, I think I have as far as certainly I can follow conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not a Spanish speaker, but okay. but I can follow conversations. And that's great. It yeah. used to be when we when I first got married, we'd go to my wife's family, and they would all speak in Spanish. I couldn't hear a thing. I would hear blah 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 blah, and then Kurt, and then they'd laugh, <laughs> and I'd get nervous. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, yeah, right. So you and your wife have four adult children. Could we do. you give us some parenting tips? So Nate and Charity, Nate's my oldest, he has a podcast himself called Financial Pathway, which okay. has been very successful. And he helps churches and pastors with finances. Um, started that business probably, oh, I guess seven or eight years ago. Then, uh, and he lives in Tampa. Mm -hmm. My son, Josh, pastors in Tampa. He, he and his wife, Rachel, they just started a church mm -hmm. and they have two children. So Nate has three. And then Caleb and Cassie is my third. Uh, he is, he'll be turning 30 this year as well. He also wants to start a church. Mm -hmm. So he'll be moving to that area, working with his brother and then starting a church out of that church. Okay. And then my daughter lives in Australia. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So she went with me. Now think about how unwise I am. So I do this single adults conference every year in Australia. Okay. So one year I said to my single adult daughter, hey, why don't you go with me to this single adults conference? What was I thinking? <laughs> so my single adult daughter goes to a single adult conference where she meets a single adult. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, right. So then that was it, you know, and those Australian guys, they don't even have to be good looking. You know it's the saying? accent, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's the accent. They fall for it, <laughs> right? And yeah. So I would just say to all you guys out there, if you're struggling, get it. Just work on an Australian <laughs> accent. That's good and advice. That's it. <laughs> right. So uh, anyway, so parenting advice, 
you know, that's a separate podcast. I, I would I would probably say the main thing is be real. Mm-hmm. Like I I have a I have a theory, and that is that kids that go on for God, that have a heart for Jesus, that want to serve, mm-hmm. and I'm not talking about necessarily vocational ministry, just serve Jesus. Mm-hmm. I think the common thread is they had parents that were the same at home as they were at church. Mm-hmm. And it's not necessarily one set of standards or you know how strict a parent is. Yeah, I think a lot of that is preferential within homes, but really just being real, mm-hmm. having an authentic walk with the Lord. Mm. Yeah, amen, good. Now you uh, stay in pretty good shape, but do you have any oh, kind man. of regiment you know, for uh, physical exercise or Cam- diet cam- or Cameras lie. Yeah. <laughs> I actually weigh 320 pounds. Uh, cameras are supposed to add 10 pounds, right? Oh, really? Okay. Why well, weigh 330 pounds? Uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Do you have a regimen, especially as much as you travel? You know, how do you I, take care of yourself? I I don't have any plan. I, I, do, I do try to eat right. So I'm not like a Nazi about it, but I, I really do try to eat right. For instance, I just came off of like a five month keto mm-hmm. where okay. I was just you know, trying to trying to eat right. So and I I, I just I monitor it mm-hmm. like as far as at least weight and like my steps. Sure. I, I monitor it. So sure. I try to get good steps in. Okay. And sometimes it's just a matter of getting out at lunchtime and walk around the parking lot or yeah, right. so, something like that. So it's it's not there's not I don't go to Planet Fitness. I don't. And I probably should. I, I did that before COVID. I had a really strict regimen. I'd do four days a week and I probably need to get back to that. Okay. But but it, it seemed it seems to have worked. Now you came off of five months of keto. Yeah. So uh, did you say I'm going to do five months and then I'm going to stop? Or or you just, somebody yeah. offered you a really good meal and you're like, I'm coming <laughs> off of keto. Yeah. A, li- a little bit of both. Okay, yeah, a yeah. little bit of both. Um, I was very strict, strictly following it for five months. But then my, I never intended to do it permanently. And I don't think it's even yeah. good to do permanently. You're probably right, yeah. So I did right. it for five months so that when I came back, I could have a more moderate diet. And that's what's happened. Sure, So good. it's less bread. It's yeah. less pasta. Yeah. You know, that kind of stuff. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And then I'll say this. You know, I had an episode with my health pretty profound about two years ago. And the doctor told me that my problem was my sleep, that mm. I just it wasn't sleeping. You know, I was just go, 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 and then caffeine up. Sure. And I really took her advice, and I I just began to sleep. And so mm-hmm. my new kind of regimen is I really try to go to sleep earlier. Yeah, good. And that has been more of a difference maker than anything. And I would I would say that to people. Your body needs rest, right. and I just didn't yeah. believe that. Yeah. But I yeah. believe it now. Yeah. yeah. Are you familiar with Andrew Huberman? He's a medical doctor, but he has podcasts and a lot of good information about the importance of sleep and just how your your HGH is what is engaged while you're sleeping, human growth hormones. So just the healing. When people end up in the hospital, of course, as pastors, we do a lot of hospital visits. I sure wish those people would get to sleep more, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, but they're every two or three hours, they're getting right. poked Buzzing and, and prodded. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. But right. yeah, sleep is so powerful. Mm. You're absolutely right. Um, talk to us about Israel a little bit uh, and the business that you have as far as tours and things. Sure. So, you know, I I just love Israel. Amen. You, you you all have been. We've been. Yeah. yeah. So love you, you know, I didn't get to go. You've never been. I've never been. Oh, we, we actually went. had a trip scheduled. Mm-hmm. Uh, of course, the October seventh thing happened, but right. we were scheduled to go in November. He yeah. went, fell in love, wanted the whole church to go. Of yeah. course. So, so I was going to lead a church trip. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So I went to Israel. Back in the mid 2000s, like 2005, six, somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. And a pastor friend was just after me, you need to go. And I thought, oh, I'll, I'll go in the millennium, you know? Right. <laughs> and well, I ended up going and it just, it captured me. I can't even explain it. Mm-hmm. It just, I love geography, I love history, I love the Bible. Mm-hmm. And those three things can yeah. flow, you yeah. know, when you go to Israel. So I was just, mesmerized. Mm-hmm. So I went back the next year with, with our church. That first year I took a few people. That next year I took a full bus. Well, then every year thereafter, I took a full bus every year. Mm-hmm. And people began to hear, and I studied it, and I would guide the trip. And people said, well, we want to go with you. So I would go. Mm-hmm. Well, then when I re- resigned from Harvest mm-hmm. uh, in Pennsylvania back in 2016, I-, I knew that I needed to do something. I wasn't expecting that I would pastor again. 
So I started this company. Mm -hmm. You know, I did all the research. I flew to Israel. I figured out the business. I started my um, S corporation and just started the business. Mm -hmm. And it just, it really just exploded. I don't know if that's the best verb to use when right, it comes right. to Israel, exploded. Mm -hmm. but, right, uh, right, right. It, but it really did. And we began to take multiple groups. In fact, October 7th, you mentioned last year, we had 40 trips, 40, 40 trips on the books ready to go. Wow. And so we had a back out of all of them, wow. every sure. one of them. So yeah. I did go a couple times this year, even just myself. I took a few pastors okay. because American media doesn't tell the whole story. It was even relatively safe. So we went all my trips for this fall. So I had, for instance, this next week, I would have had 12 buses wow. Wow. Okay. on one trip. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it really has done well, but we'll see what happens. Sure. You know, when it's all yeah. over, I do have a pastor's trip. I do every year if you're a pastor or a full-time ministry leader. And that's, that's kind of a good primer. I'm mm -hmm. able to get a really good price on that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's one third of the cost of a regular trip. And so we go in January every year. And that's kind of the feeder because a pastor comes and then, like you, yeah, just yeah. becomes enraptured with it. Sure. That says, yeah. I want to take my. And then what I do on that pastor's trip is I actually use it as a training mechanism. Mm -hmm. So I train pastors, here's how you lead a trip. Here's what you say here. Here's yeah. where you bring your group. Even logistical things. Is so, so interested was I in that whole process mm -hmm. that when I earned my doctorate, with liberty, mm -hmm. that was my that was what I did my doctorate on. Oh, wow. sure. I did it on Israel is a hermeneutic. Mm -hmm. So Israel itself and the Israel experience is a hermeneutic. Mm -hmm. So and, and what I mean by that is there are things that insights that you're going to gain about the Bible by visiting Israel that you won't gain any other 100%, way. One hundred percent true. So history, yeah. geography, yeah. chronology, culture, yeah. all of those things. So I wrote. Uh, an entire paper on that. But in addition to that, I, I talked about how do you use Israel to train pastors to train people? Neat. Yeah. And so that, yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's one thing to preach John 5 and talk about the man at the pool of Bethesda. It's another thing to stand at the pool of Bethesda Correct. on the Sabbath, which the trip that, that we were on, you know, it, it worked out that way where we were there. So anyhow, I am preaching John 5 this upcoming Sunday mm. uh, at North Sun Baptist Church. We're doing a sermon series through the Gospel of John. But yeah, will you do the entire chapter? I don't know if I'm going to tackle it all at once. Eventually, I will get through yep. it. Yeah. Yep. You're at the pool of Bethesda. You should have put your foot in there. Because your plantar fasciitis. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. It's not quite, it's not the fountain of youth yeah. necessarily. But yeah. yeah. And there's no water in it today. And right. If there were, oh. you'd have yeah. to wait for the angel to stir the water. Oh, right, you might right. be there 38 years. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like that says, so, yeah. So, Brother Skelly, how would you recommend, right. maybe a lot of Christians have not had the opportunity to go to Israel. How would you recommend a Christian to pray for Israel right now? Yeah. Hmm. Considering all the things that are going on. Well, I would say, number one, that, that is our obligation. Mm -hmm. We are to pray yeah. for the peace of Jerusalem. And we we know that the peace of Jerusalem is directly connected to the coming of Messiah. Mm -hmm. So there will be no peace in Jerusalem. We know this, you know, we're as Bible believers, we, we know uh, our future and we know that there will be no lasting peace in Jerusalem until the Prince of Peace comes. Mm -hmm. So, in that sense, I think we're we're praying for the hastening of the coming of the Lord. Yeah, absolutely. That that's really the best way to pray for Israel mm -hmm. is to pray for the coming of the Lord. We know that the blinders will remain on, mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean that individual uh, Israelis cannot be saved. Of course, they can be, mm -hmm. but we know that nationally, mm -hmm. corporately, there's going to be a blind a blindness mm -hmm. uh, to that. But that does not exempt us from understanding that these are God's people. Uh, that we ought to be praying for them. Mm -hmm. You know, the Abrahamic covenant applies not only to the seed promise, but mm -hmm. also to the land promise. Right. And I think uh, I think replacement theology people would try to to argue differently, but I think you have to argue against the <laughs> the Bible when you argue against that. Um, so yeah, we, we yeah. pray for safety. We pray for uh, tenderness and openness. I, I I work with guides and and land agents, and I had the opportunity to spend time with the president of Israel, mm. uh, Yitzhak Herzog, this past uh, uh, May. 
and I got to meet with a small delegation and I was able to talk a little bit about what we do and why I bring pastors and how we support. Mm -hmm. So what a neat opportunity. It was a great opportunity. Yeah, cool. It was, it was a great opportunity. So um, this issue with Hamas on October 7th is an ongoing thing in Israel uh, from what I'm understanding. I mean, the war is still taking place. If you were somebody like Benjamin Netanyahu, like how do you feel his response was? Do you think that he responded correctly? Or if you were in that position, how would you respond to Hamas? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't wanna arm, armchair quarterback Netanyahu. He's he's really, really facing a lot of opposition, mm -hmm. you know, in country itself. I, 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 I would rather not comment on, you know, what, what I think he should do militarily. That's That's always easy to do retrospectively sure um i would say this they have every right in the world to defend themselves yes, yeah, they have agree, every yeah. right in the world to mop up gaza gaza was given her chance uh she was given uh money beyond what she would need to build honestly the singapore of the middle east mm -hmm. i mean it was all there Hamas nefariously took the money. Mm -hmm. uh, they pocketed it. They they made they enriched their leadership. Uh, they invested in a terror system mm -hmm. uh, on the backs of the people and continue to use them as shields. So we could go on and on. But to me, Israel needs to complete the mission in Gaza. That's their intention mm -hmm. to stabilize that region by completing the mission in Gaza. They need to take care of the proxy, Iran's proxy in right. Lebanon, Syria, obviously Hezbollah. And honestly, there is there is some talk among the people that I'm I'm speaking to, just kind of on the inside about a desire just to go right at Iran now, mm -hmm. just because think about it, Iran is on the cusp of nuclear weapon capability. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you know, we could talk politics, but yeah, you know, I really don't want to do that. But but I think Iran certainly has. I mean, Israel certainly has the right to defend itself. And sometimes the best defense is offense. Mm -hmm. You yeah, know, no think yeah. about it. Should should we just wait until people throw bombs on us? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, yeah. if we have intelligence that suggests the the amassing of um, an arsenal against us yeah. is not the best defense. An offensive strike. So, um, to your original question, I, I I'm just a layman, so I I, I don't want to give a yeah. a military opinion. Those were interesting Good. insights. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what about you mentioned earlier the uh, American media isn't telling the whole truth necessarily. Are They're there not. are there cultural commentators, maybe some media pundits that you do learn from and you think are balanced or reasonable that you could recommend? You know, it, it's like it's even. I think with with all learning, it, the 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 more we can go to primary sources and and try to distill the information ourselves, mm -hmm. the better we are. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of consuming sources from third party media, the best we can. You know, look at events and ask for a measure of wisdom mm -hmm. and 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 try to spend time thinking before we just run to the person that we already know will agree with us sure yeah you know, that, right. that that's to me that's the bane of of right wing uh, talk shows mm -hmm. right which i don't listen to yeah, yeah because it's like you're not listening to somebody else you're listening to yourself right you're listening to what you already believe the echo and you're chamber. choosing somebody that says it you know m more uh yeah articulately wittingly sure. that, yeah right yeah you're yeah right. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, so I think a lot of Christians are listening to people like Tucker Carlson or Ben Shapiro or Dennis yeah. Prager. Yeah. And there's and there's some and there's they've got some good insights. I'm not for certainly not saying they don't. Yeah, right. Yeah. And of course, Ben Shapiro, as a Jewish individual himself, he is passionate. He is about these things, and he is. I do learn from him. I do have I do gain some interesting insights from from Shapiro. Uh, talk to us a little bit too, if you would. You mentioned politics. Um, what about politics in the pulpit? You know, people will say, oh, that was a real politically charged sermon, maybe as they assess this or that in a preacher. Uh, what's the balance of, of politics? I put it in quotes because it's such a general term, politics in the pulpit. Yeah. Um, I think every church has to kind of figure that out for itself. You know, churches are in different regions. They have different, mm -hmm. you know, their politics are local, they're, they're regional, they're national. 
Uh, I'm not a big fan of leading with politics. Mm -hmm. You know, for instance, I'm not going to do a sermon series on the election. I'm not going to preach a message where I start with the position I want to defend mm -hmm. and then try to assemble Bible verses to... Right. I, I, I'm a big fan that the Word of God is sufficient. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan that as we preach through the Bible, verse by verse and chapter by chapter, mm -hmm. it's going to meet our needs. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's not to say that we can't look at applications, you know, even within. And, and the, the wonderful thing about preaching through a portion of Scripture, a book of the Bible, for instance, I'm in 2 Corinthians right now mm -hmm. in our church, is God has a, a very unique way of bringing that Scripture to bear upon our current situation. Mm -hmm. And then when people hear that message, they can't say, oh, our pastor is just reacting to the news this week. Sure. No, yeah. Yeah. he's he's preaching this series of mm -hmm. messages and look at the sufficiency of God's word in this application. Mm -hmm. So don't preach personalities, preach, preach principles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And people are smarter than you think they are. Mm -hmm. So as you give them the principles, as you preach the word of God, they have the, they have the ability to overlay those principles on the current political seen mm -hmm. and they're able to make those decisions it's so nuanced yeah i mean because we we tend to be so polarized in our political support so for instance we we might be like all trump we're all trump and yo kamala's of the devil and and <laughs> but but here's the point it's so nuanced right yeah, yeah. it's so nuanced yeah, of course i could never vote for kamala I could, I personally, I'm speaking personally now, I, I never could, you know? And so then we get into the lesser of two evils debate, you know, yeah. but can God, can God bless pride? <laughs> right, right, can, right. Can he? Right. And of course he says, no, I can. Yeah, right. Matter of fact, it's the first thing I hate. Right. So we're in this conundrum, mm -hmm. aren't we? Yeah. So every election, no matter who the candidate, no matter who it is, the lesser of two evils. Yes. You know, it's yes. so, yeah. And it seems like in the 21st century, the evil is more obvious in the yes. candidates. Yes, yeah. that's right. I, yeah. I would agree with that. Yeah. Yep. Um, you mentioned uh, pride being the first thing that the Lord hates. I think you're mentioning Proverbs chapter six there, that the Lord hates a, a proud look and mm. lying tongue and hands that shed innocent blood. Yeah. Um, so Dr. Skelly, um, uh, talk to us about a healthy church family and maybe some elements of uh, how to cultivate that kind of vitality in a church family. You feel mm -hmm. like the, the churches you've pastored, they all seem to have your personality. Some people say that the church takes on the personality of the pastor. You're an energetic guy. Do you feel like your churches are full of vitality, the churches you've pastored? And how do you cultivate that? Mm. Yeah, I, I feel like, um, yeah, I don't I don't know that the church would have, ha would have adopted my personality I'd have to think through that. Um, I do think that you're onto something, and that is that I think the the most important word when it comes to church is health, mm -hmm. you know, spiritual health. I really believe that, and I think that pastors and pastors' wives, leadership teams, I think the more that we look at ourselves as those who preside over health, mm -hmm. the better we are. Mm -hmm. That's our job. We preside over health. You know, I'm not a huge fan of every principle of the purpose-driven life written years ago by Rick Warren. Mm -hmm. But I do like the one theme, which is healthy things will grow. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe that. Mm -hmm. Healthy things will grow. If things are healthy, they grow. And so our job is to preside over health. Mm -hmm. You know, Think about it. Churches grow when people are walking with the Lord, when they're right individually, when they love their church family, when there's a spirit of unity, they'll invite their friends, yeah. they, they'll they bring them. That's how churches grow. They yeah. grow organically. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. They don't grow through the these methodolo methodological transactions mm -hmm. you know, where we can guilt people and you, know, you need to go out and pass out 10 flyers. I'm not against passing out flyers. But the point is, we're not mechanizing growth. Mm -hmm. Me me mechanizing growth is then we're no different than any business on you know nine mile road right no yeah. we we need to preside over health and allow that organic approach to do its thing mm -hmm. yeah. that's that's what we see in the early church yeah absolutely yeah. Talk to us about Veritas. Um, you are the chairman of the board of that college. Uh, so maybe share a little bit too about like kind of how it started and your burden to invest in these next generations. Sure. Uh, Veritas is 
the old Virginia Baptist College. So we are 40 years old. Okay. So we've been around for, for a long time. Mm -hmm. The church at which I pastor now, Faith in Fredericksburg, is the mother church of the college. So, and it was more of a regional college. Mm -hmm. So when I went to Faith Baptist, I had no desire to be in Bible college ministry. Sure. You know, I, I, I'm here at a Bible college right now, right. you know, yeah. in, in Florida. Um, and our, kind of our mantra at Veritas, we renamed it Veritas because when I went to Virginia Baptist College, it was a small school, maybe 50 students okay. total. And some, you know, maybe half were taking courses online uh, and then some were on campus. It just, it just wasn't, mm -hmm. it wasn't going anywhere. And there were some profound, even financial issues. Mm -hmm. So I decided, hey, we're gonna own the online space. Mm -hmm. So we made a, a bold decision to say, we're just gonna go online. Mm -hmm. And this is before it was in vogue. We're just gonna go online, just do this, and that'll be our niche. Mm -hmm. So we did. And we saw some really good growth, mm -hmm. uh, like immediately because of that. And the, the value of that was we were able to talk to a number of respected professors around the country. Mm -hmm. you know, we're not limited by time and space now. We've mm -hmm. got people. So for instance, we have 50 adjunct professors, 37 of which have a terminal degree, like an earned doctorate. Mm -hmm. So the, the education is great. Mm -hmm. Now, we have been careful to say, we don't compete, we don't compare. Mm -hmm. Like our spirit is, we're one team. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of great Bible college that I preach at, that I love, that we support. Yeah, you know, I we have thirty students right down the road. Okay, know, sure. Here. Yeah. So we we don't have any. We don't have a bone of of competitive in us. Mm -hmm. We just have a we have a kingdom mindset. Yeah. We want to help people. Ironically, where, where we've really found. A niche within a niche is in our graduate and our postgraduate programs. Mm -hmm. And we're having a lot of, mm -hmm. of guys that are in ministry that are coming and- Sure. And, they and, wouldn't have time to do in class. Right. So when did you make the change to be online? Uh, Almost immediately. That's great. And about what yeah. year? That was 2017. So you guys were all set for when COVID happened. We were ready. That's great. Yeah, yeah. all of a sudden yeah. I look smart. <laughs> just, just a good guess. You're ahead right. of the trend. I, I knew all it. about COVID. I called it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. So uh, as much as you get to travel, and then the investment you're making through the college and things, uh, you kind of, I would say, have a an opportunity to have your finger on the pulse of fundamentalism. Hmm. What, what would you say uh, maybe are some strengths and weaknesses in like today's independent fundamental Baptist churches? Mm. Wow, that's a loaded question. It's a very loaded question, James. <laughs> <laughs> I don't intend it to be so much, but yeah, I, I I don't know that you could call. I don't know that there. I don't know that fundamentalism means anything. Uh huh. Yeah. Like, and, and what I mean by that is, in the Jerry Falwell days, it did. You yeah, know? I don't think it means anything today. I think if you were to say, independent fundamental Baptist today people would, it would have nine definitions. Mm, yeah. You know, I think that if I said that, I think that you cannot use the term IFB today mm. without qualifying it. Mm -hmm. That's true. So people yeah. say to me, Kurt, are you IFB? I say, if you allow me to define the words I am. Sure, yeah. But I don't lead with that. Mm -hmm. Like I don't lead and say, we're an IFB church. Mm -hmm. I don't say that. Mm -hmm. That's not it's that it's not an embarrassment. You lead with Baptists, probably. We're a Baptist church. You know, I don't even lead with Baptists, although we are unashamedly Baptist. Mm -hmm. I lead with we preach the Bible mm -hmm. and we love Jesus mm -hmm. because I want to start there. Yeah, I want I want to start there. I want to start with Bible words. I want to start with Bible priorities. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's you know we love Jesus and we preach the Bible. Yeah. Now I think if you preach the Bible, you're gonna have Baptist distinctives. Yeah. Yeah, right. I think if you preach the Bible, you're going to see the value of autonomy. I think, so, but but I, I want to be able to to speak into those terms, mm -hmm. you know, with, without allowing somebody else to to pin them on me and make me do something I'm not. Yeah. 
That's the same way that like Vody Bauckham answers the question, are you a Calvinist? Mm. He's like, well, let's define those terms. You know, he right. wants to walk through very complicated soteriological things right. and either affirm or reject uh, those those ideas. And, and, and I think there's wisdom in that. I think there's wisdom in that. And and and, and few, very few people really just want to talk about it anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, a lazy mind seeks generalities. Mm -hmm. A lazy mind right. seeks stereotypes. Yeah. Because when you do that, then I can cut off a whole swath of people with one term. Right. I can just dismiss you with one term. Yeah. And and that's not life. Mm -hmm. Right. Life is way more nuanced than that. And that is the way our politics have, uh, right. you know, devolved. Exactly. Yeah. Is it's yeah. It's either fully endorse President Trump, or if you criticize him at all, then you're not on my level of, you know, or, or, or Kamala or whatever side you're on with all that stuff. That's right. Yeah. You mentioned that you're preaching through Second Corinthians at your church. I am. Um, and with your podcast, Everyday Truth, uh, you do books of the Bible as well. I do. Are you also in Second Corinthians? Doing I that am or? not. Where, no. where are you at with that? In fact, that's a really good question. I don't think I've ever been asked that. So my what my desire has been at faith mm -hmm. is to get through as many books of the Bible as I can. Mm -hmm. So I don't I don't double dip. Mm -hmm. So I never do on my podcast a book that I've done at church. Okay. Because then that way somebody can consume mm -hmm. content from my message and, and consume content from my podcast and they're different. That's sure. smart. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's a little bit more work, but it's it's way more valuable yes. in the long run. Right. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. How did that get started? Like, I mean, because that's a lot of work, definitely. Mm -hmm. You're mentioning yeah. it's. I was doing two a day for a couple of years. Okay. I was doing a video podcast and then my audio podcast. The audio. So I just went to YouTube like a, this year. So I, I, I'm just new to the game. I should have started it years ago. So I just did that. It's growing slowly, but it's mm -hmm. growing. P people, most people listen to my podcast. So we have several thousand a day that would listen to the podcast every day, mm -hmm. everyday truth. And, you know, some, so maybe 500 a day would watch it. Okay. So, so that's where it's at right now, but we're trying to build it. Not, not, I'm not trying to build a name. I'm really not. God knows my heart, mm -hmm. but I really have a passion that people be in their Bible every day. Amen. Yeah. Is it a, a 20 minute podcast or no, something? It's, What's the time frame? It's, 13 to 15 minutes. Oh, that's great. Yep. Yeah. So I, it's consumable. It's, yeah. It's consumable. Mm -hmm. And what's great in the podcasting world is you listen to it at 1.5 speed. Right. Sure, right. Yeah, yeah. So it's a 10 minute podcast. You're already high energy. You're yes. already talking about You're already fast, at 1.5, brother. Yeah. But, but people listen and consume faster than what people talk, mm -hmm. even fast talkers. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, one point five really works for me yeah. for for people. Even me when I listen to podcasts, sure. sometimes I do the same thing. Are yeah. really slow talkers. I I go at I go at two. Yeah, right. Ben Shapiro, I go at like point five. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, exactly. We should all talk really fast for the rest of it, so people that have it on one point five are really confused right now. <laughs> yeah, it's like four. Okay. It's actually really well done. <laughs> yeah. You should be an auctioneer. I do it at home. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've raised three sons. Oh yeah. yeah. So she's, she's she's perfected that. Uh. Yeah, talk to us about your life first. Do you have a life first, Pastor Skelly? You know, I, I, when I sign Bibles, I don't like signing Bibles. I think it's a weird practice. But, you know, rather than argue, I just sign a name of my Bible verse. But uh, the two verses I, I put down, I put down Romans one seventeen, mm -hmm. which is the just shall live by faith, mm -hmm. because that is our life. Quoted from the Old we, Testament. Yeah, right. Right. Habakkuk. Yeah. So, and quoted three times in the New Testament. Yeah. But Romans one seventeen, and then Hebrews twelve three and four. Mm -hmm. you know, consider him mm -hmm. that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, mm -hmm. lest you be weird and faint in your minds. Mm -hmm. So I think ministry stability and ministry continuance is really a focus on Jesus. Yeah. So, yeah, I signed that one. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Good. Yeah. Well, Pastor Skelly, thank you so much for joining so us much. today. Yeah, uh, this was fun on the <laughs> podcast. Yeah, I you feel like we. Drove around a couple of blocks. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, the Lord used you to offer strength for life to people. Amen. So many of your answers are, are Bible focused and that we understand that's where true strength comes from. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thank Amen. you for joining us. Amen. And thank you for joining us on today's podcast. Uh, if there are ways that I can serve you or be a help to you as a pastor, I'd sure be happy to do that. You can email me directly at pastor at northstonebaptist.org. Okay, thanks again for joining us. We do recognize, as I mentioned, that strength for life comes from God because he is our refuge and strength. He is a very present help in trouble. All right. Thanks again for joining us on Strength for Life.